our traditional society. And I can't emphasize enough how many women of all walks of life, of all ages, went down to Tahrir Square to participate in those protests. All right? Now, since women were being so visible, it became a threat to the police and to the government. They understood that now they have two components in the population. It's not only men, but there's also women. And this is where the systematic abuse stop, took place. I don't want to say started because it's implying that there has never been abuse towards women in the past. There has been, but now it's becoming so much more systematic and Dr. Nadia Abu Zahra is going to talk more in details about that. This graffiti shows a bra. You're right, you guessed, it's a blue bra. And this was in reference to a young woman that was in the protest and the police tore her blouse and threw her on the ground. And this is what was shown from her chest, the blue bra. So this became very simple. Now, I want to move forward. There are so many events that happened between January 25 to something at 11 and the removal of Dr. Mohammed Morsi. We have addressed them in the previous sessions and you will see some of the titles on our flyer. Obviously, I don't have the time to go through all of them, but we just say that I, the military coup removed the first elected president of Egypt. And this, has, this is an unprecedented fact. First, that he was elected. That was a first for Egypt. And the way the coup happened. All right. Not, oh, but not only the coup happened. In other words, not only they were satisfied to remove him under the pretext that so many people were protesting against his rule, but they also undertook to eliminate any opposition. And this was done in a brutal way, in the most brutal way. And this brings me to the massacre of Raqqa that took place August 14, 2013, right after the coup. Those who wanted, protested the coup, they were gathered in what we call, in what was known as Raqqa Square in Egypt. There were thousands of them. They stayed there day and night in a vigil during the month of Ramadan under the heat, 45 degrees at least of sun, and they stood their ground peacefully, I must add, peacefully. They said, we will not leave the place until our president, the elected president, returns to his office. So the army found no other way to dismantle the, the protest except by lethal, by killing them, actually killing them. And this is what we call the day of shame. And as uh, Dr. Uh, Mohammed El Masri had mentioned a few days ago in this forum, that it seems that Egyptians had lost their humanity. I feel so sad when I hear this, but it's absolutely true that there was support for the removal of those protests. Of course, no one, to say also the truth, thought that the army would actually go and kill all the protesters. Even those who wanted to leave peacefully, they had no choice. The numbers different as to how many victims, at least officially, it's up to more than a thousand. But in reality, there were much, many that were killed. There were some horrific pictures that I'm not going to reproduce here, but I'm going to talk more about the resilience and the determination of the Egyptian people. At our rally that's taking place this Saturday, August 14, in commemoration of the massacre, you will see the sun, Raba. Raba in Arabic means four. It's true that it refers to the name of the square where the protest took place. But the name of the square also refers to a mosque, which is the Rabah Mosque. And who is Rabah? Rabah is a saint. She's a woman. She was born in Baghdad. She was a, came from a very poor family. And she was sold in slavery. 
and her master was particularly cruel towards her. But she was so resilient, she was so courageous, she had so much faith that finally he liberated her. She became a, a free woman. And this she conquered only by her courage. I think we should get be inspired by Rabah and by her story. And we know that to reverse the situation in Egypt is going to be a long haul. It's going to require a real struggle. But nothing comes easy. And if we don't do our part, we feel that we have not lived up to our expectations for the revolution of 2011. So this is for Rabah. Asma ibn Taji, she was the only daughter of Muhammad ibn Taji, one of the first democratically elected members at the parliament, and he was a key figure in the Muslim Brotherhood. She was 18 at the time, she was shot and killed in the square. And there is evidence, filmed evidence, that she was targeted. So this is targeted killing, no more, no less. And she is not the only one. Now, we have another sad story, and this is from a family that lived in Toronto. The man is the late Amr Qasim, and she is Asma Hussein. While preparing this presentation, I had the opportunity to talk to Asma. She's such a courageous woman. I have assembled some of the photographs that will illustrate the story. This is Asma and her husband, 2011. Here they are together. I can see love in their eyes. Here they're in Toronto. Here the good news, they have a daughter. And here they went to Alexandria in 2013 because they wanted to show the little girl to the parents of Ram. And this was really tragic because after Rabah, which was on the 14th, he went down in one of the squares of Alexandria and he talked about the injustice and he talked about what happened in Rabah. And unfortunately, this is what happened. He was killed. He was, this was target killing. His wife explained to me he got a bullet in his chin and the bullet exited from his neck. So he was instantly killed. This is another picture that she sent me. We can see here the man. And this picture was taken by uh, what I can see here is Rust.com, which seems uh, to be an, an official or uh, a professional photograph. So what is this man with the gun? This happened the next day during the funeral. She told me that when they went to bury her husband, thugs came and attacked them. Fortunately, no one was killed, but they were throwing rocks at them. And she told me that a rock came across her face. Why? Because they, they said there was an ikhwani, so somebody from the Muslim Brotherhood that's being buried. So they were attacking the people at the funeral. So this is the kind of repression we have seen since the military coup in Egypt. I'm going to talk here about the case of Giulio Regina. Now this session is devoted to women and you're going to tell me, so why talk about men and bring this case up? My argument is men are not alone. They're, they also have sisters, they have mothers, they have wives, so it's never one person. And this sad case of Giulio Regini, I'm bringing here to your attention because unfortunately it was his mother, who was still in Egypt, he was Italian, he was doing studies in Egypt, he was killed, he was kidnapped by security forces in Egypt, he was killed and his body was found. Not only that, but there were severe marks of torture on his body. And his mother was the one who went and identified the body. 
and then she made a presentation at the Parliament, uh, the uh, European Union Parliament in Italy, and she talked about how she found her son and about the torture he went through. And the Parliament listened to her and took measures against Egypt. Now my question is how many Egyptian mothers have seen their sons in similar states and who is listening to them today? Have they been to a parliament? Have we talked on their behalf? Our concerns, our concerns is that Egyptians are living under unchecked dictatorship. There is no freedom of speech, no justice, no respect for civil rights. There is a relentless campaign assimilating any dissenting voice to terrorism. So nobody can say oppose what the government is saying. The media is falling asleep. So I call this a compliant media, and we had a whole session about the media. Internationally, no one wants to talk about Egypt as if this is not important or not relevant or, as it has been mentioned several times, we are going to accept it because the authorities there are helping us in fighting uh, Daesh. There is a white corruption and this has not been addressed. So those are basically our concerns. There is also the unreported war in the Sinai and this is part of the blanket on the media is that we don't get what actually goes on on the ground and this is one of them. And if you don't think that families are suffering, you can just see the, the reports about the house demolition, how they have cleared entire zones of the population along the border just to prevent any infiltration from ISIL. And guess what? It is counterproductive. There is research showing with uh, details how, in fact, the opposition of ISIL or Daesh has been strengthened by this campaign, by this ruthless campaign. So it's not a war that we're going to, uh, that uh, the government is going to win, CC government is going to win. But this is what he is selling to the West. Now, I have put this map here to show the borders of Egypt. So we have one border with Libya and the other border with Israel. Now, the border with Libya is also becoming significant because the, the West don't want an unbridled immigration from Libya. So it would be easy to go from Libya across the frontier to Egypt and to immigrate from Egypt. So they want to prevent this. So you want the, the watchdog at the border. And who's playing this role now? Mr. Isis. This also has some demographics. And we can see that in Egypt we have a problem with the numbers of people that are not multiplying. It's 30 million in 1960, today we're about 90 million. So it's a big problem. Okay, now where is the U.S. in all of this? Now again, they, they say, well, the military, we're going to trust them, they're going to fight Daesh for us, we feel secure, and they're turning a blind eye. I also get the argument that, well, it's not so bad in Egypt, it is worse in Syria. What we have to remember that it's, this is how it started in Syria. And Egypt is threefold bigger in terms of population than Syria. So you can imagine what we are going towards. More problems. Okay. Now, what is the role of Canada? Yesterday we had a whole session about what Canada should do. Basically, we want Canada to advocate for human rights rather than just say we are helping Egyptians by supplying military equipment. What is the way to move forward? There's no other way except democracy, respect for human rights, and a national reconciliation.